I'd like to introduce uh, myself and and our guest speaker. Uh, I we uh, I'm president of Engineers for a Sustainable Future, and uh, we're a nonprofit organization interested in uh, uh, sustainability, and and particularly we focused on on climate change, and we evaluate issues on a state and okay. national level, and. Uh, we have monthly meetings with uh, experts on a variety of uh, topics related to sustainability and climate change. Today, we are honored to have David Colin as our uh, presenter, and he is a member of the Xerces Society. Uh, he is involved in community science, and one of the things he mentioned was the, he's a uh, for the Pacific Northwest of California, he's a Bumblebee Atlas member, and he writes pollinator-focused articles, and I think he'll tell us a little bit about that at the end of the presentation. Uh, the presentation goes for about 50 minutes, and uh, Dave has asked us to uh, hold our questions until the end. And uh, with that, Dave, it's all yours. Okay, I'm going to go try to see if the screen share will work. Oh, host disabled participant screen sharing. I need to, Adam, could you work a screen sharing thing? Uh, I think you need to make him a co-host. Okay. That's how we did it before. Yeah. You are on. Okay, let's try it again. So, are you able to see me? Yes. Or see, yes. not see me, but see see the presentation. You bet. Um, let's see if I can get rid of some of the pictures here, so I can see what I'm doing. Uh, Okay, oops, sorry. Let me go backwards here. So I'm, what I've done here is uh, I've made a hybrid presentation. Um, there there was some interest in pollinators that was uh, uh, put into the original request. And so part one, I'm going to introduce you to pollinators. Uh, it's not in-depth. to give you some information. Uh, hopefully, you'll learn some things that you don't already know. Um, my pollinators, I normally talk for close to an hour on those. And then part two, we're going to talk about climate change and biodiversity um, and how they uh, impact each other. So the Xerces Society is um, a 50-year-old international nonprofit that is dedicated to conserving invertebrates. Um, the Society is named after the Xerces blue butterfly, which is the first butterfly known to go extinct due to man-made activities um, or human activities. And if you look, uh, it's at the bottom of this page here um, to the left hand side, 30 and 31. And the inset photo is a very close relative. And that's a pretty good idea what the Xerces blue looked like. Well, anyway, when this went extinct, a couple of uh, lepidopterists got together and they said, you know, we're going to do something to help keep this from happening in the future. And they started the Xerces Society 50 years ago. And now, you know, we continued working. So why do we care about insects and other invertebrates? Well, E.O. Wilson is a famous scientist that you may have heard of. He said they're the little creatures that run the world. And if you look at, at it, that's really very true. So, you know, uh, invertebrates, they're providing us with decomposition services. Uh, we'd be, you know, up to our eyeballs and waste without them. They provide biocontrol. Many food chains, uh, the, the base of those food chains are invertebrates. And then, of course, pollination services, which are really important to us. Uh, we work in four main areas, conservation, advocacy, research, and education. 
Um, in conservation, you know, we'll work with uh, federal, state, local agencies, farm organizations, et cetera. Um, research, we work with hundreds of scientists around the world um, on different research projects. And education and outreach, well, what I'm doing right now is an example of that. So we, I'm, I'm a Xerces Society ambassador, so I volunteer to do this work. Um, and there are, oh, roughly 70 of us uh, across the United States that do these kind of things. I mean, in the 50 years that we've been around, we've protected and restored over three and a half million acres for insects and other invertebrates. So now I wanna talk about pollinators a little bit. Why do we care about pollinators? Well, you're a bunch of engineers, smart folks. I probably don't need to tell you this stuff, but pollinators are really important for plant reproduction. 85% um, of flowering plants require a pollinator in order to propagate. If you look at that percentage in terms of all planet, plants on the planet, um, it's 67%. So two thirds of every green thing out there requires a pollinator. So it's obviously quite important. From the perspective of food production, there's a figure that's used quite commonly. One in three mouthfuls of the food and drink that we consume require pollination services for a good uh, you know, seed set, fruit set. Um, depending on your diet, uh, that can change. But you know, unless you eat a lot of cereals in which it might be one in four, um, you know, one in three is a good number. Uh, globally, there are 1,200 crops, things that even include uh, cocoa um, and things uh, that require pollination. And in 2015, the market value of that was you know, somewhere around a half a billion dollars, those pollination services. And so we're getting a lot of things out of these pollinators. Some years back, Whole Foods put together a demonstration for their customers to show them, you know, what pollinators really are bringing to us. So the picture you see now is a produce department. And this next picture shows that same department after they removed all the uh, fruits and vegetables that required pollination services. And you can see there are a lot of empty spots out there. They did the same thing in the dairy department. So here we've got a full shelf. And this is what it looks like after you remove things that require pollination services. It may not be immediately obvious why all those things disappeared, but it's because of alfalfa. Alfalfa is a, a main feed for a lot of dairy um, and farmers need seed and you need pollinators to get seed. Another thing they do is in terms of supporting other wildlife is you know, if you think about the food webs out there, um, you know, they are central to many of these uh, fruits and nuts that are consumed by birds and mammals, small mammals and things like that. Um, and pollinators, pollinators themselves can become the food. Um, and if you look at this grizzly bear, you might be saying, now, what the heck is this thing doing here? Well, grizzly bears, they like consuming something called a miller moth. A miller moth is a little moth. It's about a half a calorie worth of moth. And in the fall, they during the daytime, you can find them in big aggregations under rocks and things. So up in Yellowstone, grizzlies, when they're fattening up, they'll overturn these rocks and maybe consume 20,000 moths in a day. And they're putting on 10,000 calories doing that. So it's kind of a surprising thing when I first heard it. And, you know, we get a lot more than that. Um, we get flowers in the springtime. Um, you know, one of my favorite things, pumpkin pie. So th there's some cultural things that we get out of these pollinators. 
So I want to talk a little bit about pollinator diversity here. There are six main groups of pollinators. So here we've got butterflies. These are orders of, of uh, insects. Butterflies, moss, a fly, a bee, a wasp, and a beetle. And all of these are pollinators, but bees are by far the most important of these pollinators. And I'll talk about why that is. But the other five groups or orders, I, I call um, accidental pollinators. They're not going after pollen, they're going after nectar. And sometimes they get pollen on them and they carry them to the appropriate plant and they provide some pollination service. Now, before I get into the bees, why they're so important, I wanna just, for those that are not aware of this, how do you distinguish between bees and wasps? Because sometimes I'm amazed, you know, someone will say, come over here, I got bees all over the place and they're coming out of the ground. And I know that that's probably not a bee and it's a yellow jacket or something like that. So bees are hairier. If you look on the left and the females will have some kind of a pollen carrying structure usually. Typically it's on the hind leg. And if you look closely, you'll see that they're packed with pollen. Um, wasps on the other hand, um, they don't have much hair on them very angular looking. Um, if you compare the legs, they look like they've got little chicken legs compared to a bee. They hold their wings out differently. As you can see, bees, it's over the back when they're at rest and the wasp or in a V shape typically. How about a bee versus a fly? So you're probably thinking, well, anyone knows what a house fly looks like. I'm not gonna get that mixed up with a bee. Well, I'm going to tell you there's some flies out there, for instance, that look almost identical to a bumblebee. And the only way you know whether you have a fly is you got to catch it in a net and look at it closely. So bee, bees and flies, the easiest way to distinguish them is if you can get a good look at the head, a fly will have really short antenna on it. Bees have a long antenna, typically with a little elbow. Again, you might see a pollen carrying structure on females. Um, flies have got really huge eyes that almost meet at the top of the head. Um, and bees, not so much, and bees are more on the side. So those are some kind of giveaway things. And now I wanna get on to this, why are bees so important? Well, they've got three behaviors that these other pollinators groups don't have. Number one, they're collecting and transporting pollen. If you remember, I said the others are out there nectaring and they're accidentally getting pollen. Bees use pollen to feed their larvae. So in raising their young, they are using pollen. So they're out there, they are collecting and transporting pollen. They're not accidentally getting it, they're going for it. They're central area foragers, which mean they forage in the area around their nest. And the other thing is that typically they exhibit something called flower constancy. And what this means is that when a bee is out on a foraging bout, if there are enough of the same species of flower, they will tend to stick with one species of flower on a given foraging bout. So when I talk about a foraging bout, I'm talking about they're leaving their nest, they're going out to collect however much pollen they can carry, and then they're going back. Um, it's not strict, you know, so there is some deviation. But this constancy is something that is obvious enough that Aristotle talked about it and wrote about it in the fourth century BC with respect to honeybees. I want to just explain how bees actually carry this pollen. Um, for something called like a bumblebee, they, we refer to these as curbiculate bees. They've got a pollen carrying structure on their hind leg. They've got a flat spot, kind of equivalent to where our thigh is, that has hairs all the way around the outside of the flat spot. And that allows them to go and take moistened pollen and pack it down in there. 
And so they call that a pollen basket. And this picture shows you how much pollen they can actually carry. That's That pollen lump is much wider than their leg is. Most bees transport pollen dry. Um, the most... Seems we've lost Dave. And if you're if you really pay attention, you see one of these, you'll you'll see them walk across a flower and tap their bottom down on the flower to get pollen to stick up in these hairs. And then after they've got a load like that, they'll hold that, that up so that it doesn't brush off accidentally. Most people, if you say bees, this is what they think of honeybees. Honeybees are not typical. They're highly social. You most of you probably know this, they're very complex social animals. Um, they live in large col colonies. Uh, they can be tens of thousands of individuals in a colony. And they're not native. So they were brought over with the early colonists to provide beeswax and honey. Beeswax was actually the most important so they're not native. Uh, and the other thing is they're a perennial. So colonies can last for years. Um, and so they're not native and we're not going to talk about them because, well, um, we deal with native bees. I will say, though, I want to recognize that they're extremely important for agricultural reasons. Um, and so I'm not kind of giving them short shrift here by not talking about them, but Xerxes does focus on natives. If you look at our native bees, 90% of them live solitary life cycles. So unlike social bees, like bumblebees or honeybees, 90% um, of them are, are single in the, in the sense that a female creating a nest is working on her own. They're very gentle. They're unlikely to sting. Um, if you slowly approach a bee with your finger and you try to just touch it, it'll probably fly away. But if you do touch it, it will definitely fly away. And it's not going to turn around and try to sting you because it, it, that just doesn't work for them. They're not protecting anything like social bees are. Honeybees, they can be a little bit more aggressive because they've got it built into them. Um, oops. In the world, there are over 20,000 species of bees. If you look at North America, north of Mexico, there's roughly 3,600 species of bees that have been described. In Oregon and Washington, maybe there's six to 800 species. Um, you know, I, I work with the Oregon Bee Atlas, um, and, and that's one of the things we're trying to do is to help determine how many bees species are there actually in Oregon, because nobody knows. Um, a city the size of Portland, maybe there's 100, 150 species of bees. And then um, in, a, in a nice backyard habitat where you've got plenty of flowers and things, you could have 30 or 40 species of bees in your own yard if you really have something nice put together. One aspect of diversity is size. Here we have a Photoshop of the smallest and the largest bees in the North America. That big black head belongs to a valley carpenter bee. Xylocopa is the name of this genus. This is the largest bee in North America. And the little one is called a, a perdita heard at a minima, and it, or sometimes people call them fairy bees, and you can tell how tiny this thing is. And so if you saw one of these flying around, you probably wouldn't even guess that it was a bee. 
it looked like a little gnat to you. Other aspects are just the way that these bees look. So here on the left, we've got this metallic green sweat bee. And some of you have probably seen these if you've looked in your yards. Um, they're really beautiful under a microscope, really fun to look at. Um, this is a fuzzy legged leaf cutter bee. You can see it's just really hairy. There's no doubt about why it's called fuzzy legged. This happens to be a male. You can see how different these two are. And then here we have a nocturnal bee. And if those bee, if those eyes look like they're kind of on the large size, well, they are. Uh, this bee has evolved to be able to uh, forage under very low light conditions. The eyes on this are 30 times more sensitive to light than normal bees are. And so if there's a, a bright moonlit night, these bees can actually go out looking for flowers and continue foraging. And then finally here, we have a cuckoo bee. And for any of you that know about cuckoo birds and how they parasitize nests, um, cuckoo bees do much the same thing in the bee world. Um, and I don't really have time right now. I, I don't want to get sidetracked and start talking, but if anyone wants to know more, then please ask me a question when we get to the end of the presentation. I want to talk a little bit about the natural history of native bees. So when biologists use the term natural history, what they mean is, you know, how, how do they make a living? How are they surviving out there? What we have here is a typical solitary bee life cycle. Um, there's a lot of variations on this, but you know, th this is pretty good uh, for showing things. This female bee here is a mining bee and she's going to live about three weeks. That's it, as an adult. Um, she's going to work her tail off um, and basically work herself to death over those three weeks. And she's going to provision maybe uh, one cell, one brood cell per day on average. I mean, if you look on the right, you're, you see a cutaway of what a mining bee nest might look like, well, it does look like. Um, and that ball that's orangey yellow is a pollen ball. Sometimes people call that bee bread. And it's going to take her maybe four or five trips in order to gather enough pollen to make that ball. And when she's done, she's going to go lay an egg on it. She's going to close off that nest entrance. And over a period of, oh, you know, roughly two months or so, that egg will hatch, it'll go through various larval stages and end up in what's called a prepupa um, and will stay in a cocoon underground for somewhere around eight to nine months. And then the next year, the cycle is going to start out all over again. These ground nesting bees are roughly 70% of our bee species. So the majority of our bees nest in the ground. Um, they look like ant nest um, from above. And a lot of times they are, they will nest in aggregations like this. Um, and so one question I like to ask people when I'm, you know, out is, you know, how do you, tell the difference between an ant nest and a, and a bee nest if, if you come up on a, one of these things, right? And so, well, the answer is you stand there for a minute and if you don't see any ants, then it's probably a bee nest. Um, you know, ants are really active and, you know, you don't have to stay there long to see a few of them. Bees, you know, they're out for maybe 15 minutes at a time, 20 minutes, and when they come back, they don't like to make a show of it. They hit that hole and they're down inside. And unless you happen to be looking at just the right moment, you won't see the female enter or exit. And you won't know that it's an active nest. On the right, we see a couple of examples of 
some of the structures, what, what these things look like architecturally underground. And this is just, you know, these are just a couple of the many different variations there are across species of ground nesting bees. Um, the other 30% of our bees are tunnel nesters. Um, the, the ground nesters, they actually dig and excavate their necks. Tunnel nesters, they like to find either an existing tunnel, maybe something that was created by a, a, a beetle larvae, or they can sometimes excavate the center of a soft stem that's been cut off, that's open to them. So they'll uh, excavate out the pith of that stem and they'll create a series of brood cells. And you can see that in the above photo. And after they provision the, you know, the, the innermost cell, they, they provision that with a ball of pollen, and then they build a partition and they start the next one. And they lay an egg, obviously, before they partition. And they start the next one and they work their way out. Um, some bees, the, the, bee, the leaf cutter that I mentioned earlier, they like to line their nest with pieces of leaf or flower petal. And these are not haphazard pieces. They can be 25, 30 different pieces. And they're cut precisely to a size and shape that the bee needs. And I've seen some cutaway photos of some, some of these. And it's just amazing how they are putting these together. Um, so there's a, a tremendous amount of work that goes into this. If you look at the variations in nest materials, we talked about leaf pieces. Uh, there are some species that use pebbles and plant resins, like this dianthidium uh, here. Um, mason bees, I'm sure most of you heard of mason bees. Um, they use soil. And so when they're plugging up their nest, their tunnel nest at the end, um, they cap it off with soil. And then finally, there's even some species of bees that use plant hairs. So if you've ever seen um, what they call it, lamb's ear, um, it's got this kind of velvety leaf on it. These bees will go in and they'll bite those, scrape them off. And this ball here that looks like a, a wad of cotton, uh, I don't know if you can see, there's a little white mark below that that's a one millimeter. So this is maybe a centimeter in diameter. Um, and that's been pulled out of an existing tunnel space. And in the dark area in the center is where she's got her, where she'll lay her eggs and put her pollen. Now, bumblebees are a perfect example of one of our ground nesting social bees. Um, uh, and their life cycle uh, is also annual like solitary bees. Um, most bumblebees hibernate over the winter. Um, they're, they'll dig in under leaves and things like that. And that's why Xerxes recommends um, in the fall, if you can leave some areas of leaves on your property, um, that's good because that provides a place for hibernating bumblebees. Somewhere late winter or early spring, they come out and they um, start foraging to build up their energy reserves. and they're look, they start looking for a nest site. Once they found that, they go and collect pollen. They create a little uh, wax bowl that's to the right of that queen, that picture that you see um, under the log there. Um, and they fill that with nectar so that they can stay within the nest for a while. And they lay eggs and they incubate that first batch much like a bird incubates eggs. And after five or six weeks, those first eggs will hatch and she has workers and she's never going to leave again after that. Well, she continues to lay eggs. The workers take care of it, go through a couple of cycles and somewhere late summer, early fall, after about 10 to 15 weeks, um, what we have is we hit something called colony changeover. And at that time, the queen is going to start producing reproductives. So she's laying eggs that are destined to be new queens next year 
or males to fertilize those queens. Well, hopefully queens from other nests, so they're not interbreeding. Um, and after that, the queens, the new queens, they call them gynes actually, will go and find a place to hibernate and the males will die off after the flowers are gone or the temperatures get cold enough. And then the cycle repeats. Bumblebees, they like areas kind of like this photo here. Um, they love to use existing rodent dens. So uh, a mouse or a gopher den will have some insulation in it. And they like uh, their entrance holes to be hidden. They don't want anyone, when I say anyone, I'm not talking about people, but they don't want anything seeing them go down um, and possibly cause problems for them later. Um, so they like to you know, kind of have a hidden area. Um, on the right, you see a photo of one of the few species that actually lit, um, nest above ground. And this is in a tussock of grass um, that's providing some cover for them. And then finally, um, flowers. It's a very important thing. And I talked about, you know, pollinators, nectaring, um, and bees being more, also being there for pollen. Um, one thing that's important to note is that bees fall into these categories. Um, we have generalists, which can take pollen from nearly anything. And, and we've got specialist bees, which maybe can only uh, take pollen from uh, a few species of plants. And in extreme situations, there are cases where a bee will only use pollen from one species of plant. So these are highly specialist bees. And that's going to come up later in the presentation is why I'm bringing this up now. And so before I get off pollinators, I just want to point out that uh, there's a new a license plate out there that you can get in Oregon, Pollinator Paradise. Um, should you uh, want to do something like get one of these plates, some of the proceeds from that license plate support uh, ongoing bee research down at OSU. So now we're going to go and switch over to part two of this, um, climate change and biodiversity. How, how are these things mixed or how do these things interact with each other? So um, we have to address climate change because that's one of the problems with the um, decrease in biodiversity that we're seeing. Um, and then on the other hand, when we start to look into the science behind things, we see that we can use biodiversity to mitigate and adapt to some of the problems that we're having with climate change. And so, you know, mitigation, we're working to reduce the causes, right? And adaptation, well, we're adapting to things that have already happened. So if we look at insects um, as kind of a uh, an indicator for overall biodiversity, um, that'll tell us a lot about what's going on. Um, over half of all the described species are in fact insects on this planet. So what's happening to insects is, is gonna have a big impact on what's happening to biodiversity in general. How do you know that we're having declines in insects? Well, actually Mike brought this up in an email. Um, it's the windshield effect, right? Uh, I remember, you know, when I was in my twenties driving across country or something, and you'd be lucky if you could get through the day without having to pull over somewhere and, you know, scrape all the bug guts off the windshield, right? Um, and now you can go all day long and you hardly have any insects in some areas. So there's definitely something happening. Um, International Union for Conservation and Nature, they've done comprehensive assessments of 14,000 uh, species um, in actually uh, groups in the Americas, so that's North and South America. And they determined that a quarter of these, 25%, are at high risk of extinction. 
So we're not talking about, you know, they're threatened or they might have a problem. We're talking about high risk of extinction here. Um, and, you know, in the world, I, I should have said, you know, across the world, there's been a lot of studies here. These are uh, just an example of some of the individual studies and what was found. Sorry, I missed that the first time through. Um, but just to show you that this isn't just something happening in the United States and Europe, it's everywhere where we're really looking. Um, so what are some of the causes? Well, there are a number of them. Um, the most, and there's actually more than what's listed here. But um, right now, pesticides and habitat loss are in general the two largest, not necessarily in every place, but these are the real drivers of insect decline going on right now. Um, climate change is also there um, and it's coming up. And, you know, I think over the next 10, to personally, I think over the next 10, 20 years, you know, it's going to overtake and be probably a number two because a lot of work's being done on pesticides now to try to get um, better ways to manage uh, pests. Climate change, as we know, well, you know, things seem to just be getting worse. We're not really trending anything downwards. Now, if you remember at the very beginning, I said, why does Xerces care about invertebrates? And we went through some examples of things that invertebrates do for us. Another way, another framework in which to put these things is something called ecosystem services. And the, the, the definition of ecosystem services includes this more anthropocentric viewpoint. So it's things that support human life, right? Um, so when we look at things that way, well, pollination, obviously, um, water filtration, a lot of invertebrates in it, out there are providing things like that that we take for granted. Um, their nutrient cycling, again, we already saw that. And then carbon sequestration. This is an ecosystem service that's really important, with, you know, especially with respect to the challenges we're having with climate change. So it's important to know that biodiversity enhances ecosystem services. It's been shown in numerous studies that biodiverse systems are more um, resilient when it comes to perturbations to the system, right? Um, a, a bad thing happens. The more species you have in an ecosystem, the more likely it is that over the long term that can survive, right? So if you've got some bad things happening, maybe it doesn't wipe it, wipe it out. Carbon sequestration. Well, you know, nature's really good at doing this. You know, you look at this forest here, there is a lot of carbon tied up in those plant tissues out there. And if some of this gets harvested into, say, structural wood products, they, they'll continue to be sequestered, the carbon, for a long period of time. And you know, more trees are planted and we take up some more carbon. So, you know, nature's great at helping with this. It's not just forests, grasslands are important. And when you look at a picture like this or a picture of tall grass prairies, it's really important to bear in mind that the majority of the biomass is underground. You don't see it. There's far more biomass underground than there is above ground. Well, I'm not counting the bison, obviously. Uh, mangroves, really important. In the United States, we don't really have them except, uh, you know, on the Gulf Coast, there's maybe some black mangroves down there in certain areas. But from a worldwide perspective, these are very important for carbon sequestration and even seagrass beds. You know, there's wide areas in the oceans, close to shore, obviously, where we've got seagrass beds that are sequestering carbon. Now, I don't think this group, I'm not gonna spend much time on these next three. Um, you, I, I assume you all know that humans are, say, a very important component in climate change that's going on right now, human activity. Um, 
you've all seen these kind of uh, charts, I'm sure, where they're looking at te temperature anomalies with respect to some kind of a baseline that's out there. Um, and of course, some people will argue, well, there's a blue spot up there. So I guess that we don't really have global warming going on. But, you know, you know better than that. Um, so, you know, what kind of things happen? Well, again, I think you're a well-educated group. You know that, you know, temperatures are getting warmer, um, heat waves more frequent, um, longer duration, precipitation. You know, again, um, it can be droughts and flooding. Um, some people will try to say, oh, well, it flooded. You know, how can there be a, you know, there's no drought, so there can't be global warming. Well, they don't understand all the details of how things work in reality. Um, extreme events. It's always a mistake to, when I see people point to a hurricane, you know, a category five hurricane and say that's because of global warming. No, you never want to say that because any particular instance is not you could, there's no way you can prove that that's due to global warming. All you can say is that the uh, frequency is going to increase, right? And the intensity. And then oceans, well, sea levels are going to continue to rise. And then we've got this little nasty little problem of ocean acidification. And if you're an organism that requires a shell, you know, you're making a calcium carbonate shell, um, real hard to do that when the carbonic acid levels get very high in the ocean. How does climate warming in general, how is that going to affect pollinators? We know how important they are to us. Well, one way is physiology. Um, if you look at, at these animals, they've got temperature ranges that they've evolved to survive in. Um, as an example, this bumblebee here, um, or, or bees in general, not just bumblebees, but um, the flight muscles on those, um, they heat up when they're flying around and foraging. And so um, when those tissues get to somewhere around 43 degrees centigrade, they can have permanent damage to those muscle tissues. So what they do when it gets too hot is they just don't forage. And if that happens often enough for large periods of time during the day, then that's going to affect their survival. Um, phenology, I'm going to talk about that separately, but so I'm going to kind of skip this. Um, can, rain shifts. Um, if you need to move somewhere cooler, what are your choices? Well, in the Northern Hemisphere, you can move north generally. Um, or you can go up. Well, the problem with that is you can only go so far north and you can only go so far up. And so what happens when you run out? You go extinct. And, you know, increased temperatures affect plants pretty drastically. So when, it look, when you look at things like nectar, both the quality and quantity of nectar that's available in plants can change when the temperatures start getting higher, they do change. So this is a phenology chart. And what we see here is we're looking at how things occur through the calendar year. So, you know, Thoreau had notebooks full of these kind of observations. People have been doing this for hundreds of years. And the large bees are bumblebees. And if you look on the left-hand side, you can see that the flower colors that are suitable for bumblebees, bumblebees are generalist bees. They're not real picky. They can use that pollen. This little green bee that you see on the left next to an orange flower, that's one of these specialist bees that I talked about earlier. So if we look in the month of May, we see the specialist bee and we see that that orange flower is blooming in the month of May. So that's a good thing. This, they're in sync. And we'll let this thing go through the remainder of the year. And as long as there are bumblebees there, there are adequate flowers out there and life is good. Now, what happens if we have what's called a phenological mismatch? That means bees and flowers are getting out of sync. Well, let's start the wheel and let it go. 
So we'll stop in May again, like we did last time. Uh, if you look closely, you'll see January, we had a flower bloom that didn't bloom previously. No harm, harm in that. Um, bumblebees had forage when they needed it. But where's our little green? Uh, okay, here's our little specialist bee. Now, it should be obvious that we have a problem here. The problem is that orange flower. When did it bloom? It bloomed in April. Now the bee's out in May. It's a specialist. It can't use the yellow or the red flowers. So what's going to happen? What's going to happen is that bee is going to die and it's not going to have any offspring for a next generation. And, you know, this is a very real concern that people have right now. And whether or not they get very far out of sync, that's, a, you know, a whole presentation in itself. So we can't really talk about that, but I want you to recognize that that's something that can happen. And then we'll let this play out. And it's pretty much the same as the previous time. So, you know, this is just an example of, you know, some of the real damage that can occur out there. Um, there's been a number of studies done where they've looked at um, insect declines with respect to uh, temperature increases over baselines, some kind of a historic baseline. Soroye um, looked at bumblebees in particular and found a correlation between bumblebee declines and where current temperatures were greater than the maximum baseline temperatures. But again, as engineers, you'll recognize that correlation is not causation. Right? Something that we always try to keep in mind. Doesn't mean it should be ignored though. Um, Forrester looked at some data sets on Western butterflies. By Western, we're talking say Great Basin over to the Pacific coast. And over 40 years, they had a 1.6% decline per year. And 1.6% is not very much. They multiply it by 40. And that means that we have now one third of the number of, of butterflies out there on the wing that we did 40 years ago. That explains what some of that windshield cleanliness that we have these days. These declines are most strongly linked to fall warming. So there are studies continue and they all show the same thing. You know, they're all just basically adding more and more to support this idea that, you know, these increasing temperatures are really starting to affect species out there. So, you know, what can be done? Well, one thing that we can help do is bear in mind, you know, it's not a one-way thing. If we help with biodiversity um, by looking at, you know, uh, protecting habitat, uh, increasing connectivity between patches of habitat, and then reducing some of these additional stressors. Remember when we talked about the things that are causing insect declines, um, like uh, pesticides, et cetera. If we do this, we can help strengthen biodiversity. And again, biodiversity can help in terms of things like sequestering carbon. These are nature-based mitigations of climate change. Uh, it, it also, you know, benefits diversity in general. And remember these other ecosystem services that we get. So, you know, biodiversity, like I said earlier, biodiversity enhances the strength or, you know, the, the function of these ecosystem services. Um, this is an example of some of the work that Xerxes is doing it is doing on the habitat area, um, say with something like uh, USDA has got a natural resources conservation services group. We've got partner bio, all, we've got Cersei staff that are partner biologists with NRCS. And we'll work with say farm groups, is, like you see here in this picture, to increase the biodiversity in those properties, um, introduce climate smart plants, this hedgerow here is really one of these corridors where you're 
able to create connectivity between maybe existing patches of natural areas. Um, and of course, you're getting some additional carbon sequestration here. Um, just in general, when we're doing habitat work, we, we want to make sure that we're putting as much biodiversity out there as we can. When you look at an ecosystem, when you measure the richness of an ecosystem, you do that by looking at the number of species interactions there are. And so the more species you have out there, whether those happen to be insects or invertebrates or plants, the more species, the more in species interactions you get. And that will lead to an increased resilience in that ecosystem. Now we can even help at home ourselves. Um, I'm gonna not go into any detail here because I'm gonna show you some resources in just a second. But um, you know, if you're doing gardening and, and things like that to maybe do some pollinator enhancement in your area, um, you wanna use a lot of natives, uh, pesticides, get rid of them, stop using them. And if if gardening is something that you're at all interested in doing, um, go to xerxes.org. Um, if there's even a chance, take the time to write this down, xerces.org. Once you go on that website, there's a resources section up there. And if you click on that, go to the drop down, there's a Pollinator Conservation Resource Center. And down below that, you can see Pacific Northwest region. And if you click on any of those bluish colored bars there, um, what you're gonna get is just a number of different things that you can download freely um, and either just read it on your computer or you can print it out and all kinds of different topics. Uh, Xerxes has a lot of books available. Um, if you wanna learn more about uh, native pollinators and what you can do, this Attracting Native attracting native Pollinators is a really great book in that area. Um, and you know, as I draw to a close here, I just wanna say that you know, we're a member-based organization, always looking for new members. Um, we're a, uh, rated four stars by Charity Navigator. Um, that's the highest rating that you can get. And um, I guess now I just want to say thank you for taking the time to listen to me talk. Uh, if you have any questions, I know I went a little bit fast through some of those areas. If you have any questions, I'd be happy to uh, stick around as long as I need to to answer. Well, thank you, Dave. Uh, and I know that I especially appreciate your cus customizing the uh, your presentation for a bunch of engineers here. So that's that's much appreciated. <clears throat> Is there anyone that has a question that uh, I'd really like to ask? What what we'll do is is uh, uh, Dave, if 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 you could get me a little bit of verbiage, and I will send that out to our members and anyone that wants to join uh, Xerxes uh, would have that information. Uh, is is that possible? Sure, and and like I said, there's a free newsletter. You don't have to, you know become a member you that there's a free newsletter that um you might you know sign up for it by email and just read a couple of them and if it sparks some interest then you can think about um number one continuing to get the newsletter um if you don't like it you can unsubscribe and you know if you think xerxes is an organization that's worth supporting um in the work we're doing um you know maybe become a member and do that Thank you much, Dave. Sure. We'll uh, look forward to hearing from you and uh, talking to you in the future here. Okay. Well, you take care and thanks a lot. Okay. Bye. Yeah.